Well, if you came tonight looking forward to Terry continuing on the Prophet series, I'm only, um, I've got half a good news. We're continuing on in the series, but it ain't Terry tonight. You have yours truly. If you're new here and you don't know who this total stranger is, I'm Bill Search. I'm one of the pastors here at Crossings. And Terry kindly asked me, since he's out of town, if I'd carry on the series tonight. And tonight, he gave me one of my favorite prophets. He said, rather than cover kind of the big idea of the thing, I want you to focus in on Jonah. Just out of curiosity, last week, no judgment here, but last week he challenged everybody, read the book of Jonah, only four chapters. How many of you read? It's a short one, right? How many of you learned something in the process of reading it, right? There's a lot of the Jonah story out there that people partially know. They know part of the Jonah story. They know that God told him, go talk to some people in another city, and he did not want to do that. They know that. They also know somewhere in there there's a fish or a whale that's involved in some sort of digesting incident, and then Jonah is digest, not digested, but taken into the said um, water creature, and then therefore is eventually deposited back on shore. He goes and does some work, and everybody lives happily ever after. They know some version of the story. In fact, somehow, some of the Old Testament stories that are most PG-13 or R-rated have made it into children's books. The Noah story is a story of human devastation for wickedness, and we make it a delightful toy in a children's nursery, right? We have the story of Samson. Don't read the version in the Bible to the grandkids. Get a kid's book that cleans it and sanitizes it all up because that guy's a mess, right? But Jonah is something similar. And just for fun, as I was working on this and I was uh, kind of doing some different investigating, I'm always curious what's out there on the World Wide Web. And I found this lovely image that should inspire us all around <laughs> Jonah. This for $24.99 can be yours at walmart.com. I didn't put the website because you can easily find it. And I love this picture because it sets all the wrong tone. Jonah, he's got a little smirk smile on his face, like this is gonna be fun. I love the water and I love fishing and all this. And even the whale looks like he's having a good time, right? And you can jam little stuff Jonah inside and zip the mouth closed. What a, what a nice thing to give the children and the grandchildren because that's exactly what the story is not about. No, no, the story of Jonah that we discover in the Bible is fascinating, and there's a reason that it has captured the imagination for people who are young and just young at heart. And there's so many different takeaways from this. I was interacting with a friend of mine who serves as an army chaplain. As a matter of fact, he's, he serves in the chief of chaplain's office. He's had a glorious career. He's had a really interesting experience in his career. And he loves the story of Jonah. And we were going back and forth and talking about Jonah. And just before the lesson tonight, I even told him, I'm like, boy, just studying this reminds me. I need to teach more out of Jonah. And we're going to cover it in one hour. But you could cover it in books. In fact, let me recommend one to you right now. There is a book. It's fairly recent, last 10 years or so, called Prodigal Prophet, and it was written by Timothy Keller. He was a Presbyterian minister in New York City, passed away about a year ago. Keller's books are all very good. This one is fantastic. It will tell you and draw more out of Jonah than you would think is even possible. I listened to it and thought, man, that's so good, but if I use it, it's plagiarism if I don't give credit. So I didn't use his stuff. So it's good though. That's the one book besides Jonah I'd recommend. So let's get into the story of Jonah. But before, and some of you are anticipating, you're like, I know where we're going to go. If we're starting with Jonah, where, we, where would we start? Where's the first time Jonah's mentioned in the Bible? Jonah, right? No, no, actually the first time we see Jonah is in the book of Second Kings. Did any of you know before tonight that Jonah appears in the Old Testament outside of the book bearing his name? 
but most people don't. It's just a little quick reference. And so I'll read it. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah. So this is what happens in kings. They date the different monarchs against each other, the monarchs of Judah and the monarchs of Israel. And so he's talking here in 2 Kings about the monarch of Judah. But during that time, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king in Samaria. This is a period of time known as the divided monarchy or the divided kingdom. There's Judah to the south, and they go back and forth between having good kings and not good kings. And then there's Israel to the north that goes from having bad kings to worse kings to bad kings to worse kings. So this is a king in Israel. He comes to the throne in Samaria, and he reigned for 41 years. That's a long time. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he didn't turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Now, before we get a little confused, there's two Jeroboams, you're right. And if you were to look at like sort of a timeline, not in the Bible, but a timeline, the guy we're talking about is Jeroboam II, not Jeroboam Jr., because he's way down the product line of bad Israelite kings. But nonetheless, he is just like the first Israelite king. He's a bad one. He's wicked. He caused Israel to commit sins. Verse 25, he was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea. Now, what's interesting, a little editorial comment is he was a bad, wicked king that caused the people to sin, who was also really good at his job and expanded the borders and brought financial prosperity. Who knew that that was possible? You can be a terrible, there's a, you could be an awful person, an awful leader in a country full of awful people and you could still have peaceful, prosperous times. Pretty good deal if you can get it. Well, during this period of time, it says the God of Israel spoke through his servant, Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. And the Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, and it just goes on from there. But in the spirit of Terry Fakes, I've brought a map. <laughs> so Israel is the kind of the, the deepest of the blue there, the kingdom of Israel, and the star marks Samaria. That would be the capital city. And you can see the kingdom of Judah, which don't feel bad. It's small, but it does okay. And then you can kind of see the surrounding kingdoms. But what it demonstrates is this. This is the point of Israel when their borders were the most vast. This is a time when there's great strength in Israel. And it was during that time, a prosperous and peace-filled time, that Jonah was a prophet of God who had the unenviable task of occasionally talking to the king. Now, we don't have any of his prophecies to the king. We don't have any of the confrontations with Jeroboam II. We just know that that was the period of time in which he lived. Now, um, this is, um, as I mentioned before, what's fascinating is sometimes we get it in our mind that during especially Old Testament times, when there were times of prosperity and peace, it meant people were good and honoring to the Lord. But what we have seen in this series, but what we see throughout the history of Judah and Israel is that's not necessarily so. In fact, there's a bit of a, a truism here that peace and prosperity is a blessing from God. That is true, but it is not, it does not necessarily indicate his approval of the people or the nation or the leadership. It's just part of the facts of the Old Testament, but it makes sense when you think about it. The Babylonian Empire at one time was vast and prosperous and it had peace mainly through military conquest and threats of all their neighbors. But they were not good people and they weren't great leaders. And so it is through ancient history and modern history, that is how that goes. But we learned something from that previous text. We learned that, that Jonah lived during a particular time that he lived in a town called Gath Hefer. Gath means wine press and Hefer means uh, well. And what we do know is the location of that town. And interestingly enough, the location of that town was about 15 minutes from a town we know from the New Testament known as Nazareth. If Jesus is a boy or a young man cared to take a stroll, he could have easily gone to the town in which Jonah lived and did much of his work. Uh, it was also only about a five to 10 minute walk 
to another town we know of in the New Testament known as Cana. And if you know anything uh, from the Gospel of John, Jesus shows up at a wedding and there's an embarrassing moment for the family because the wine runs out and he solves it for them. All of that's in that same kind of little terrain. I don't know if that interests you, but I find that interesting. Does it have anything to do with the story? Not really, but it's still interesting. And it is in the spirit of maps, which would honor Terry. So let's move to the book of Jonah because time is of the essence. This is where we're really getting to tonight. It starts with this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah of Amata, uh, son of Amata. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. How many of you would um, love an assignment like that? I want you to imagine the city that comes to mind that you, if God called you and said, that city is doomed for destruction unless you go and tell them, I want them to turn around. For every one of us in this room, it'd be a different city. I'm not asked, don't shout out cities, but there'd be some obvious ones for different people, especially if you're more patriotic, you might say Beijing, or you might say Moscow. I'm from Michigan, so I'd say San Francisco after the cruelty they showed to the lions on Sunday. It was (laughs) uncalled for and unpatriotic. But for each person, there'd be some city. And the Assyrians were bad people, they weren't nice. They, they don't, there's not a fan club of the Assyrians. They, you know, there's people who do that Civil War reenacting, no show of hands. We don't want to embarrass anybody. So, you know, there's people who do different things like that, but there's nobody who does Assyrian reenacting because it would be impossible to reenact. They were just awful people. There's, a, there's art galleries, or I should say museums, all across the globe that display art that was found in the palaces and the government building of the big provincial centers that moved around a bit of the Assyrian Empire. I just want to show you a handful of them. I know Terry's shown some of these as well. This is one, it's a relief, and it demonstrates a, a, a kind of a, a siege engine that's going up a ramp, if you can kind of make that out, and there's kind of double swords sticking out of it, and there's archers, and there's people who are being conquered underneath it. There's a, a bit in the background that you can't see, but there's a nice close-up of it. It's just tender and darling. These are three men impaled on sharpened poles. This was kind of the Assyrian signature move, impaling people. It was cruel to be sure, but at least if they impaled you, it was generally quick. Later, the Roman Empire would say, now that one is too quick. We'll come up with a different method, crucifixion. But, But this was, just consider this, this was artwork in administrative buildings and in palace hallways They have other ones. This is a a delightful scene of a man who's about to uh, be uh, cut, have his head cut off. Uh, Here's another one. This is just your typical war scene where there's there's the cavalry who have the bows and arrows and underneath them are the defeated enemy. Uh, This is uh, another one after the enemy has been captured. These are men. Just imagine this. Somebody, an artist was commissioned to take their instruments and carve in stone the picture of men being flayed, cruelly tortured. So just think about the diplomat showing up in Nineveh to say, hey, uh, we thought we'd establish some trade relations with you all. But in order to go see the people that you're gonna negotiate, you walk through hallways. Here's one artist's rendering of what it originally would have looked like. Those reliefs now have no paint on them, but the assumption or the belief based on archeological finds is they probably had some paint. It would have been multidimensional. It wouldn't have just been painting on the wall. It would have leapt from the wall. And as you walk through, you would see impaled people and you'd see conquered foes. And then you would sit down and they would say, now what were the terms you were thinking? Because we were thinking different terms. And this is the Assyrians. If you were on the border of the Assyrian Empire, you did not like them very much. But all that violence, all that imagery had imbued itself into the culture. And what historians tell us, not biblical historians, just people who dig in the earth and find these things, they say they were a pretty tough bunch. 
they didn't literally take many prisoners. They put a lot of people to death and then they put some just right into slavery. And so um, the Lord comes to Jonah and he says, the people that do that, who are just on your northern border, I want you to go talk to those people because if you don't talk to them, they will be under they will be under divine wrath and punishment and I will wipe them out. If you were Jonah, what would you do? If I go talk to them, they might turn around, but if I don't go talk to them, you'll take them out? I have a really nice idea. And so does Jonah. So Jonah ran away from the Lord and he headed to Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and he sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. And here's an interesting map. It kind of gives you a sense of it. Tarshish, nobody really knows where Tarshish is. Uh, different scholars have said, well, maybe it was Carthage in North Africa. Maybe it was Sardinia off the coast of Italy. The, the best kind of guesswork on it is it was a port in modern day Spain. It was on the other side of the Mediterranean. It's as far away from Nineveh as you can get. And so the Lord says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, I don't want to go to Nineveh. I'm going to go in entirely the opposite direction. And what's fascinating though, is that Jonah is a prophet of the Lord. And what does the text say not, I want to get away from this place. Who's he want to get away from? I want to get away from the Lord. Here's an easy question for you. Can you get away from the Lord? Did Jonah think he could get away from the Lord? It, uh, prob probably not. No, probably what he was trying to do is get away from anyone who would reference the Lord. He was trying to get away from the Lord's people. Anybody who would remind him of the Lord. And this is, again, one of those, I, I think of it as a kind of a truism of sort. It's, it's true most of the time, not all of the time. But when a person flees from God, when a person is trying to get away from God, often they flee from God's people. Have you seen this? A person, um, they, they know maybe decisions they're making are very poor decisions so what do they do? They withdraw from anyone who would say, this is a bad idea. Have you done that? It's a pretty common phenomenon. If you just think on it, I imagine either your own face will come up or you'll, you can picture some people. They begin to withdraw. And so Jonah comes up with a logical plan. If I go all the way to Tarshish, the odds of bumping into somebody, if I go up to Tarsus up in modern day Turkey. There, I'm going to bump into some people. There, there's a synagogue up there. And if I go back down into Egypt where my people come from, they'll know about my people. But if I go way out on the western edge of the Mediterranean, maybe there I can get away from the people. And so uh, as the story goes, and I think you probably know the story, it says, then the Lord sent a great wind. He's aboard the ship. He sends a great wind and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And all the sailors, what, they're terrified. And what do the sailors do? They start doing what people do in situations like that. Even people who don't have a particular belief system start trying to make deals with God or God as they best understand him or it. And so these people, they were, there's nothing that, would indicate anybody aboard this ship besides Jonah knows anything about the one true Lord, but they start talking to whatever they call Lord in that given moment, but nothing seems to work. So they finally say, let's cast lots. Let's cast lots. So at first they go get Jonah and like, dude, you're asleep. There's a fierce storm and you're asleep. Let me just hit pause. Do you remember there's another story in the Bible where there's a fierce storm and men terrified for their lives and they're on a boat and someone's asleep? Do you remember this one? It's Jesus, yeah, it's Mark 4. Where they're on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, of course, is not fleeing, but he's out cold and all the guys are, well, they're praying and hoping, but they think they're dead. So here they go and they get Jonah and they, they cast lots. They... They literally draw straws or, 
roll die or whatever they do to establish who done it. And Jonah knows it's him. Jonah's fully aware, says, well, okay, it's me. I'm the problem. He says, I, I am a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and dry land. And it says that this, they were terrified. They're like, well, what have you done? Why would you put us in peril? I mean, Jonah doesn't have any concern for their lives. He's just sort of blasé about this. And he says, well, as the sea gets rougher, he says, well, here's what you need to do. Throw me out. Just pick me up. Throw me into the sea. And then it will be calm. I know that it's my fault. And this great storm has come upon you. And uh, it's, it's so fascinating here that, that um, what Jonah doesn't say is, you know, it's my fault, I'm gonna jump in. He sort of forces them to some sort of negligent manslaughter of sorts. He doesn't have the courage to just jump in the water and save them, but he knows it's him and that ship's gonna go down if he doesn't get off of it. And fascinating enough though, those men have more respect for him than he has for them. Because the story goes on and it says, in, instead, instead the men did their best to row back to land, but they couldn't. For the sea grew even wilder than before and they cried out to the Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. They figure we're gonna commit a new infraction by killing this guy and so we might solve that problem but now we have a different problem with us and so Lord, please don't blame us. And then the story goes on. It says, now the Lord, and I love this part. It's like, this is the dramatic scene. Now the Lord provided a huge fish. And this is the part where the story gets really exciting. This is the part when you're telling it to the kids, they're like, oh, very exciting. He's about to get eaten by a fish. And you're a sicko if you tell your kid that story. But, but there it is, right? And it, it, it's only kind of disturbing because we kind of know where the story's gonna go. But up till now, he just gets swallowed by a fish. The sea's calm. And I jumped to the fish fast, but it says that once the, the water went calm, at this, the men greatly feared the Lord and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and they made vows to him. And uh, it, it does show something here that uh, while Jonah grew callous about the lives of others, the people in Nineveh, the men he was on board with initially, it, it can happen. It can happen to any one of us if it can happen to a prophet of the Lord designated by the Lord that the Lord particularly commissioned for a particular task, if it could happen to him, it can happen to any one of us that we can become callous towards others. And as we become callous towards others, we can very easily begin to judge others incorrectly. These were decent guys on board. They did not want to throw him overboard. They did everything they could to avoid that. But we can, we can easily make judgments about other people as Jonah made judgments about other people. Back almost 20 years ago, it was the first time I was in Nairobi, Kenya. And it was shortly after our embassy had been uh, destroyed in a terrorist attack, blown up in a terrorist attack. Some of you remember that, late 90s. And, and it had been rebuilt. And as it was rebuilt, it was set far off of the road and there were lots of different a wire to keep people out, but we were going to meet with someone in the diplomatic corps. We were there on a mission trip. We were also gonna meet with someone in the U.S. Embassy there, so we went to the U.S. Embassy, but it had, had signs everywhere, turn in your cameras, you can't take cameras beyond this checkpoint, and then you'd have to still walk 100 yards to the embassy before you went in, so they were very sensitive about all that security stuff, so we checked in our equipment because the sign said, don't take pictures. And then we were coming out of the embassy. We collected all our equipment. And then my friend Sean's like, turn around. I'll take a picture of you in front of the embassy. Because we were like, surely they don't mean on this side of the fence, don't take pictures. If ever you're in Nairobi, they mean on this side of the fence, don't take pictures. So Sean takes some pictures and then we start walking and some men started yelling in our general direction. And at first we kept walking, but since they had AK-47s, we stopped. 
and uh, part of the Kenyan uh, National Guard or whatever, they were patrolling the outside of the fence. They surrounded Sean and I, and they wanted to know why we were so mentally deficient that we would take pictures where it says, don't take pictures. And then we realized it did say, don't take pictures on that side too. So I blame Sean. I was like, it's his camera. He did it. You know, I'll testify. But uh, they, they, uh, they began to inquire, why were we in the country? And Sean and I were like, well, we're here on a mission trip. And we're like, oh, that's amazing. We're Christians too. We go to such and such a church and the AK-47s go down and I relaxed. I had, uh, I had certain thoughts about those gentlemen before that all melted away. I'm like, they're a brother in the Lord. At least if they kill me, we'll see each other in heaven and they can apologize there, you know? <laughs> It'll work out. But I was far more relaxed once I got a, a proper lay of the situation. And, and for... For Jonah, it's going to take him a while if he gets it. There's a, a challenge here. Well, then it, it says that he, uh, he was, the Lord arranged this fish. And this is much, much in art, as we noted earlier in the stuffed animal. This is from a synagogue in northern Israel. It was found in an archaeological dig. And if you can note it, that's Jonah's feet and calves that you see below the ship. I don't know how well it shows up here, but I kind of like the fact it was three fish that apparently swallowed him, and a dolphin is tickling his feet. I'm, they just had extra mosaic pieces and decided to kind of, I don't know, fluff the story a little bit. But uh, here is, this is in one of the museums in the Vatican. This is the, it's called the Sarcophagus of Jonah. And this was in a, a, a Christian sarcophagus. And this is a close-up of it, but this is actually the length of the sarcophagus. So you can see the ship kind of off to the left, but there's the close-up. And, and don't, Jonah's both being kind of thrown overboard, but he's kind of like diving in the mouth of the sea monster. It's impressive, to be honest. That's not exactly how it goes. He got thrown overboard, and then the thing got him. But there it is. Now, I'll share one last one, just because I was so moved by this one. This is a modern pen and ink drawing. And it maybe captures them, maybe it captures it the best. Jonah's in isolation. He is, he is lost to the world. He can't get out and nothing can get to him. He's in literal solitary confinement. Now I, I know what you know, which is there's always criticism of the story around the, what kind of fish got him? You know, I mean, fish typically don't swallow people. They might chew them a bit. And whales, whales, there are not a lot of whales in that part of the, of the sea. It's the Mediterranean Sea. And this is one of the criticisms of the story, but we have to go back to where the story started, which is God, God arranged for the fish. Don't know what kind of fish. We're not told what kind of fish. One of my friends told me, uh, is the aforementioned uh, uh, military chaplain, when he was, um, when he was stationed uh, in, uh, at a post in California, his elementary age boy, Joshua, was in school and the teacher was talking about whales and pointed out that as big as whales are, they, they tend to eat very small things like plankton and such. And Joshua, being a little elementary age kid, said, well, they also eat big things like there was one whale that ate a man, he ate Jonah. And the teacher, uh, not to be outdone by the kid, the teacher said, well, how do you know that? He said, well, it's in the Bible. To which the teacher then asked Joshua, well, what if the Bible weren't true? How else would you know that a whale ate Jonah? And Joshua thought about it. He said, well, I guess when I die someday, I'll look for him in heaven and I'll ask him. I'm not making this story up. This is really true. The teacher then said, what if he doesn't go to heaven? What if he goes to the other place? And Joshua, without skipping a beat, said, well, then you ask him. <laughs> that's a good one. That's a, that's a, that's a, I do need to ask, how did that teacher respond to that? But, whew. Wow. Well, the art speaks to this, but what the art doesn't tell us is what kind of fish. There's a fish God appointed. That's all we know. And it's in that space, it's in that space that Jonah prays a prayer. 
And if we unpacked every line of the prayer, what we'd find is there's parallels in every bit of this prayer with other scripture in the book of Deuteronomy and the Psalms and in other places throughout what we call the Old Testament. To Jonah, it would have just been the holy book or the holy scriptures or the law or those sorts of things. That this is a biblically laced prayer. And I, I find this interesting. I'll encourage you just to read it on your own. I won't read it out loud, but the reason I bring this part up here is it's just a reminder, we all go through distressing, distressing times. And many times we don't always know how to pray in those difficult moments, right? What are the words I'm supposed to use? Or our words are one-dimensional and we feel like our prayer life could go deeper. And this is where I just recommend immerse yourself in the word of God. On your sheet, there should be a little website and why I provided that, and if you're watching online, it should appear in the chat or in the handout available to you. But this is a, a Bible reading plan of the book of Psalms I started a year and a half ago. It's made a big difference in my life. Where you read through the Psalms every month, all 150 chapters. You don't read 10 a day, uh, or five a day, excuse me, because some of the chapters uh, are longer than others. You'll get to Psalm 119, which is mighty long, and you'll wish you had broken it up a little bit differently. You spend about maybe 20 minutes a day, and um, that's not that long. That's a short period of time, and there's a morning reading and an evening reading. Now, this is just a little commercial for a good approach. I have found as I've gotten older, the book of Psalms means way more to me. In my youth, I used to joke, I just don't get Psalms. It doesn't speak to me. I would say this and a, as a younger man. That's because I hadn't really suffered yet. I mean, I thought I did, but you know, you don't really suffer. Some do in their youth, but mostly it takes some years, some tread on the tire different levels of disappointment and pain and abandonment. And then, then you can't imagine not having it in your life. And the Psalms will give you a language just like they gave Jonah a language. And basically his language is this, I've made some bad turns, but man, I wish I could be intimate. I, could, I wish I could be intimate with you again, Lord. I wish I could be at your holy temple. I wish I could be close by you. Well, it works because by verse 10, it says the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited him on to dry land. And uh, if you feel like that word is inappropriate in the Bible, take it up with the Holy Spirit. He chose it. It is a tough word. In fact, that word is used throughout the Old Testament of the land vomiting up the wicked. It is forceful. It is vivid. It is disturbing and it's just letting us know that Jonah got out of that fish as quick as he could and maybe as uncomfortably as he could, but it didn't take a whole lot of time and he ended up on the dry land. And then it says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, which is kind of like, okay, what's he gonna do? Is, he gonna, is it gonna be three strikes and you're out? No, 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 no. The second time he pays attention. He says, go to the great city of Nineveh Proclaim to it the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go around it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the Ninevites believed God as fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Now, now, before I read more, I, I just want to point something out. This is just kind of a, a map. It's on your handout here. But I think it's helpful because as a kid, as I heard this story, I thought Jonah got swallowed by the fish and then the fish spew him out on the shores of Nineveh. What I didn't realize until much later in life is that Nineveh is far inland. So there are two possibilities. Possibility one, is that, and most likely, he got spewed up, not too far from where he got on that boat, probably there. Possibility two, world's fastest fish. And the fish goes through the Red Sea, 
and then it, it goes through the uh, a Gulf, and then it turns the corner at the Arabian Sea, and then comes up the Persian Gulf, and then goes up the Tigris, and waves its way up the Tigris, and then spews them out in the middle of Nineveh. Could have been. Choose one of those options. I'm not ruling out a fast fish, but it seems unlikely. So let's go back to the text. So it says, uh, Jonah obeys, and when... Uh, Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh. He rose from his throne. He took off. I mean, just think about these people. These are tough, violent people. They're not easily intimidated. And you got some weirdo preacher in the middle of the city saying, doom is imminent unless you repent. And it says the king, he, he rose from his throne. He took off his royal robes. He covered himself with sackcloth. He sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king of his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows, who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that he will, we will not perish. And when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and he did not bring upon them destruction. As I showed you the map a bit earlier, here's a map of Nineveh. And, and if you can see it, what you realize is not a big town. The, the scholars debate, he said, you know, it takes three days to take the town in or three days walk around the town, different, different ways of reading it. Basically, what he was saying is, is it was probably an idiom to say, this is a very important and prominent town and you couldn't see it all in under three days. There was a lot to see. Or maybe it took him three days to hit every kind of sector of town with the same message, which happened to be in Hebrew, a five-word five sermon. But in our modern English, it's several words uh, longer than that. But it, it, it conveyed the important truth that if you don't turn from your ways, God's going to get you. And I just picture Jonah going from sector to sector in the city with a little too much glee and relish about what God might do to the people. When I was in college, I went, I went to college in downtown Chicago. And uh, the Bible college I was uh, in was uh, kind of in the near River North area. But there was another Christian college. It was quite narrow, kind of fundamentalist school that was in northern Indiana. And they saw Chicago as a mission field. And, and every now and then when I was out and about on the weekends, I would see one of their college student missionary guys. And it, I, I would stop because it was almost like it was almost like street theater, to be honest, because these guys would perch themselves on a fire hydrant. And there, you know, there'd be like, you know, a fire hydrant oftentimes has two sides so that they'd be above the people. And they would, it was impressive. I could, I don't know, I could do that. If I did it today, I'd hurt myself. But they would stand on that. They would hold a Bible as, as uh, thick as anything. And then they would scream down all kinds of condemnation on people in order for that loving God to save them. <laughs> And uh, no, I don't recall anyone ever coming up to receive salvation or a relationship with God, but everybody knew God was very unhappy with them as they went in and out of bars. But that, you know, this, is a, this could be the dangerous way that we convey an important message of salvation. The dangerous way is to do it with disgust and hatred for the people we're communicating to. And I'm not putting ideas in Jonah's mind we're about to realize very quickly, he hates these people. There's no, he doesn't want to see God's best for them. He doesn't want to see them join into the community of faith that he is part of and enjoys. He wants them out of the picture and he wants, well, maybe his nation to be the powerful one. But so, as he's going through, as he's saying this, this five-word uh, five, uh, uh, sermon, it says um, that because of their relenting, uh, there's just one little interesting artwork. I love Gustav Dory. You can, by the way, buy this. You can buy a, uh, a document or a book on Amazon by Gustav Dore, and he had done these woodcuts or these drawings of famous biblical scenes. Now, if you get one of the original Bibles from the 1800s, it's about 10 grand. But for 1999, you can just buy the reprint soft cover of only the art without the Bible. 
and it's pretty fantastic. But I will warn you right now, Gustav Dore was a first-rate artist who knew nothing archaeologically. So he pretty much drew Paris. But it's still kind of neat. It's got a little bit of a Assyrian motif with kind of that winged thing off to the left there. But the people are obviously showing some penitence. But of course, this penitence, that doesn't make Jonah as happy as it should. He said to, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong and he became angry. That'd be like an evangelist coming into town and the people respond and the evangelist going, well, that disappoints me. Or put it in just commercial terms. It'd be the car salesman is like, ah, oh, it was such an obnoxious day. I couldn't sit down. I was selling cars left and right. It was my most profitable day yet. It's terrible. I just need to lay down and dream this day didn't occur. Now it's absurd, right? I mean, it is. He's a prophet of the Lord and he has a commission and he's done his thing and the people actually responded as favorably as anyone could even imagine. In fact, the fish has caused some people to be like, that story never happened. The fish has caused some people. Other people are like, the repentance of Nineveh, that never could have happened. So there are scholars who are like, maybe there was a fish, but there certainly wasn't repentance. That seems unbelievable. But it happens. And it tells us that Jonah is not very happy. He says, this seems very, very wrong. He becomes angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? Now just pause for a second. We have no dialogue between the Lord and Jonah. Jonah is told by the Lord, go to Nineveh. He goes to Joppa the other way, and then he tries to get on the other side of the Mediterranean. We have no dialogue, but in this chapter, we finally, in the fourth chapter, get the dialogue. And the dialogue apparently went like this. The Lord says, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah says, I don't want to go to Nineveh, because if I do, they'll respond maybe, and then you will live up to who you are, which is merciful and gracious, and I know you, and I don't want that. That's what he says. He says, didn't I tell you when I was back there in good old wine press well? I said, this is what will happen. That's why I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew, I, and he just gives us some really great theology. Really bad actors sometimes know really great theology. I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God. You're slow to anger, abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I mean, isn't this good? Well, only when it happens to me. But it isn't good when it happens to someone I don't like very much. Now, Lord, take away my life. It is better for me to die than to live. I, I'd rather, isn't that something? I would rather die than you live up to who you are. Sometimes people will speculate, well, Jonah went the other way because he was afraid of the Nineveh, Ninevites. He wasn't. He was afraid of rejection. He wasn't. He was actually afraid that the Ninevites would actually listen to his message and God would spare them at least for a generation, which is what he did. And for poor old Jonah, this is a bad day. So what happens? Well, Jonah... So Jonah goes out, sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, and he sat in the shade, and he waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord provided a leafy plant and made it grow. Do you remember, you remember something else the Lord provided a bit earlier in the story? What was it? It was a fish. At the beginning of the story, it says the Lord provides a fish. And towards the end of the story, it says the Lord provides a plant. Both are things that actually, of all things, preserve Jonah's life. If he bobs around in the ocean, he drowns. Lord provides a fish. Well, it's a hot day and there's no shade. And so the Lord provides a leafy plant and he made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head and to ease his discomfort. And Jonah, this is the first time we see Jonah happy. It's nice to see him happy finally. He's very happy about the plant. Is he happy about his successful ministry tour? No, but he is happy about the plant. Jonah's very happy about the plant, but the, 
At dawn the next day, God provided. There he is again. He's providing something. What's he provide this time? A worm. He provides a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die, and he said, it would be better for me to die than to live. This guy has a lot of death wish. You know, there are times in the Bible where various people are like, I wish I was, I, I wish I was dead. But it was usually after... Uh, some terrible thing that had betook them, some exhaustion, some level of spiritual exertion that they were afraid in the end of a rope. Elijah experienced that. If you know his story, you can look that one up. There were times where he's like, I'm just ready to keel over dead. This isn't that. This is a guy who wants to be dead because the Lord lived up to his reputation and also took away his shade. There's a, there's a little just... Another, I, I, I love artistic reference points to the biblical stories. I just do. I don't know why I do. Some people find them corny and cheesy, but there's just something about, and it's a fine time in the world of art. We've been painting and sculpting things from the Bible since the earliest of days. This is a more modern, I tried to find the, the artist and I couldn't, but I love it. I, there's just some, there's a vividness to him. He looks like he's watching a sporting event. He's like, he's like, okay, if you just do this, this will happen. I want you to just put yourself on the rock for a minute. Just sit yourself down there instead of Jonah. And I want you to look out at well, something that you just in your heart of hearts wish the Lord would smite. Might be a person. Don't name them. Don't say it out loud, especially if they're sitting near you. Don't do that. That's rude. Might be a, it, it might be a situation. There are plenty of times where most of us find ourselves sitting on the rock going, Lord, would you show up and wipe this out? Wipe them out. And there's this part of Jonah where he's sitting there and he's thinking, maybe they're faking it. Maybe they're faking it. Maybe, just maybe, maybe the Lord will still take this situation and he'll still take them out. If I sit here long enough, maybe he will. And, you know, I, I sympathize with Jonah. I hope you do too. I'm not making fun of him. I find myself relating to him more than I find myself different from him. I was born uh, in 1971, some of my earliest memories with the bicentennial year. I remember the strong patriotism of, the, of that era mixed in with the vexation of the post-Vietnam War. I remember uh, just coming of age as the country was trying to refine itself and reestablish itself. And there were many things for the country to be embarrassed and ashamed about, but there are many things to be proud of. And, and most people listening in this room would say, I love my country. I, I, I'm a patriotic person. And I think that that's going around in Jonah's mind. I don't think it's uh, that he's thinking uh, all kinds of dark spiritual thoughts. I think he just, he knows this is the superpower to the north, and if they get themselves figured out, there is nothing stopping them from coming into his territory. And you know what? If he thought that thought, he was right. A little over 20 years later, his own nation would be wiped out. They would become a vassal state of the Assyrians, and the people living in the land, maybe friends he grew up with, would be deported if they were still living, taken to other parts of the Assyrian Empire. I don't know about you, but... Sometimes I think, man, I, my, my patriotism can, can eclipse other more important matters. And it brings up an important question. Now, the, the important question isn't, am I more loyal to God than I am to my country? A bigger question, which is a spiritual question, which is something that Jesus brings up time and again, is do I love my enemy? Do I love my enemy? Jesus says, love your enemy. Pray for those who persecute you. 
I love that verse. I don't want to live it, but I love that verse. I'll pray it. It's hard to live it. There's a lot of stuff in Jesus teaching that's like that. If you can do Jesus teaching without breaking a sweat, you are, you should be up here. I should not. But there's a lot of this sort of story that goes around that is discomforting. And I think this is part of why Jonah is here. Jonah is a love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you kind of story that finds its self in the Old Testament, even though that teaching is alive and well in the new. And so as, uh, as Jonah goes on, he, he finds himself in a, a different kind of predicament. It says, uh, but the Lord says, now the Lord is gonna interject a little bit. He sent a worm, but now he's gonna interact. You've been concerned about this plant. Though you did not tend it or make it grow, you were thankful for it though. It sprang up overnight, it died overnight. And should, I mean, you're, you're concerned about the plant You're not concerned about the city. Shouldn't I be more concerned about a city full of people and animals and all of that civilization? Shouldn't that concern me more? But it's a great reminder. This is where the prophet is a prophet who challenges us to this very day. Anytime any material good, creature, comfort, any time, any type of financial security, any of that is more important than the people God has called us to love. We should feel a little bit of the sting of this. What's your plan? What's the plant that's providing the shade that's so important that if it's taken away, I am enraged, I am angry. I might be even angry at God over this. I might even say, fine, what's it all worth? What's the thing And the Lord says, you're worried about the thing. I'm worried about these people. I I sent you to the people and you're preoccupied with something else. Well, that's where the um, story ends. Isn't that great? Uh, It just says that's that's it. That's the last verse in the whole thing. You can't tell the right hand from the left. And uh, shouldn't I be concerned about that? And then that's it. Jonah doesn't say, you're right. I wish Jonah did. I wish there was like a PS. Jonah's like, Lord, I'm so sorry. My attitude's been so bad. I really am sorry, I, but thank you for the confrontation. I will go away a better man. Story doesn't end there. Story just ends. Now, before we uh, assume that Jonah and his story end with that dark note, there's just a couple things that I find really interesting. One is throughout Old Testament, I'm like, post Jonah, pre New Testament in that period of time. And then in the era of what we think of as the early church, great fascination with the story of Jonah. They did not leave it alone, which tells us that at least in sort of the the fabric of the culture and the society, there was still a regard for Jonah, not as a disgruntled and disappointed prophet, but as somebody that God had used And maybe, just maybe, the reason that we have this book is because the sole witness to all of it put it down for us. He wanted us to know. It's the only thing I can figure. And wouldn't it be just like, well, a person who really had a true encounter with God that, like Paul, who would later in the early church say, I'm the worst of sinners. And if you know anything about Paul, you say, ah, oh, come on, Paul, how could you be the worst? I can name a bunch of other people in the New Testament. Judah's worse. But Paul could say, I'm chief of sinners. Not because he was comparing himself to everybody else, but he was comparing himself to the one. And so it is here. I think that there is a moment. I think there is an insight to Jonah. I think he shared his story. I think he purposely wanted it to end, not on a cliffhanger, but just as a reminder, God's right. And so here's a couple points of application that maybe will be a little bit helpful. Point number one, we should realize that we are all thrilled to be the recipients of God's grace, but many of us are less excited when God shows grace and mercy to those we consider unworthy. Just remember, Jonah shows us we're not God's consultants. This is where I mentioned the book of Psalms earlier. Highly recommend. The psalmist gets it right. The psalmist every now and then prays, God, don't forget what they did. Get them. Make them orphan their kids. Do terrible things to them. This is, it's in the Psalms. It's in the Bible. But it's the psalmist's way of saying, Lord, this is, if you want some free advice, smote them. 
but ultimately I'm gonna let you decide because I'm not laying a finger on anybody. God doesn't ask for us to be his consultants. We certainly can pray, but number two, God uses even rebellious, disobedient people to accomplish his purposes. It's a great reminder. We're never too far gone that God can't get us back on path. He might use a fish to do it, but he can get us there. Three, God uses various means and methods to get our attention. Sometimes they're really easy and wonderful things, but often our discomfort and fear are effective levers. Have you found that in your life? Something tough's going on, not always, but something tough's going on. We tune in just a little bit sharper. And then number four, never underestimate God's common grace on all people that leads them to behave with civility and decency. And we need to be careful of classifying people as bad or very bad. That's not our job, that's God's job. God gets that. We don't get to do that. It's entirely possible we'll classify people very incorrectly. And incidentally, along the way, we'll classify ourselves as very good, always. That's how that works. Now, Jonah has an interesting legacy. Here's a picture of it's now destroyed. Um, in 2014, ISIS blew this up. This is a, the, uh, a mosque that sits on top of a, what they claimed was Jonah's tomb. In 2014, when ISIS blew it up, they actually did archaeologists somewhat of a weird favor because underneath it turns out to be an old imperial palace. So the archaeologists at least have new things to investigate underneath this uh, now destroyed thing. Oh, by the way, uh, Nineveh is still around. Does anyone know what it's called now? And Nineveh is actually just a little old section of a town known as Mosul, which many of us remember during the troop surge is in modern-day Iraq. So, um, but also, not to be dissed, his hometown claimed uh, it's now gone, but they also claimed a tomb that probably was there for Christian tourists coming in from Europe for uh, centuries. Um, it may or may not be Jonah's tomb, but that's not the legacy that matters. The legacy of Jonah that matters is this one. It's in the teaching of Jesus. When uh, the Pharisees and the scribes, they come up and they try to confront him. It says, then, this is in Matthew 12, then some of the Pharisees and teachers law said to him, teacher, we want a sign from you. Now, it is interesting because this is on the heels of him casting out demons, which they gave credit to Satan for. They didn't give credit to the Lord for. So he's already done miraculous work and there's already reputation of the miraculous work. So they say, hey, do a trick for us. Maybe you can do that whole bread thing or we heard about some water into wine thing. We're thirsty. Come do something. Do a little trick for us. And this is Jesus' response. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asked for a sign but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. There it is. No, uh, as, uh, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the son of man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. At this point, they had to be scratching their heads. The, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Well, that's strong. Just think about that. If you were wondering, did the people of Nineveh actually exert genuine faith in God? According to Christ, they must have because they will stand there in judgment. And he says, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south or queen of Sheba will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom and now something greater than Solomon's here. In other words, you aren't listening. You're ignoring me. You won't repent. It will be much easier for others than it will be for you. And, and here's uh, just this kind of closing bit. Both Jonah and Jesus had a ministry in nations that dramatically overestimated their spiritual depth. I'm not, I'm not talking about the Assyrians for Jonah. Jonah had a ministry in Israel before he ever went up to Nineveh. And in Israel, there were people who were faithful followers of God, but they were vastly outnumbered by the people who were playing spiritual games and bowing down to everything on every high hill. 
And Jesus had a ministry in what we think of as the Holy Land, modern day Israel. And there were people there that dramatically overestimated, drastically overestimated their spiritual connection with God. Both, uh, both warned of impending peril. Both were in the belly of something. For three days and three nights, Jesus says, and before you're like, hey, let me do the math there. Wait, there was a good Friday, Saturday. It's an idiom for covering three parts of a day. And, uh, and also both had spectacular, miraculous, and unexpected exits from the belly of the thing that they were in. Both completed a mission after that period of time. Both were delivered from death. But Jesus is not a sequel. He is the clear and better Jonah. While Jonah ran from God but eventually delivered the word of God, Jesus said, I am, and he was the word. And so Jonah, Jonah may have given us a glimpse, but like all in the Old Testament, whether it's Moses or whether it's David or whether it's one of the prophets, they are stand-ins at best. They show us something, but we yearn for something else. We yearn for Jonah to be someone else just like we yearn for every hero we've ever had to be just a bit more. Which is why it all points forward to the coming of the one, Jesus, the, the clear and the better Jonah. Just like he was the clear and the better David, Moses, take your pick. And so as, uh, as you look at the story of Jonah, I would encourage you at some point this week, reread it. it. Take some of those notes that you took tonight and reflect backwards. And the one question I would ask us to leave with is, how do I feel about the person that fill in the blank I would consider as my enemy? How do I feel about them? Do I want, do I want them like the residents of Nineveh to turn to God or or in my heart, do I want something pretty dark for them? I'm not saying that the answer is then go to them. Maybe there's good reasons that shouldn't happen. But turn to the Lord and, and ask him, Lord, what is the message Jonah has for me? Let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you for the patience of this fine group. Thank you for the opportunity you've given us to gather together today. Thank you for the story of Jonah that challenges us, inspires us, encourages us, and points to you. We thank you for it all. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Go and have a great night. We'll see you next week.